heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, all eyes on NVIDIA as a $3 trillion chip maker is set to report earnings after the closing bell. Plus Comcast, it plans to spin off some of its cable TV channels. We talk future strategy. And the CEO of Qualcomm joins us as the company details growth of $22 billion in annual revenue over the next five years. But first, we check in on these markets, which a mm, little bit of risk off, a little bit of anxiety ahead of the all-important macro event, which both Barclays and Bank of America is saying NVIDIA. Of course, when you've got potentially an 8% move either side, that could be a $300 billion move in market capitalization. We're down by two-thirds of a percent. Move on to NVIDIA, which is up by two-thirds of a percent as well. That is one of the key points contributors to the downside today. We question the supply side of Blackwell in particular. So we want to get details of the future growth, what they did in the fiscal third quarter, where we go in the fourth quarter, that coming after the bell today. But in the interim, we've got plenty of other chip news to be discussing, and we want to welcome our worldwide TV and radio audiences. You will know Qualcomm as the world's biggest seller of smartphone processors, but the company is pushing into new markets and generating potentially up to $22 billion in additional annual revenue by fiscal 2029. Look, $8 billion a year is going to be coming from an expansion into automotive chips. $14 billion, they say, will come from the Internet of Things. Qualcomm CEO Christiana Oman was detailing that very vision yesterday. And what, your total addressable market now up to $900 million. It is great to have you here after that investor meeting. You're looking out to 2030. What gives you that confidence? Look, um, we have been, uh, first of all, great to be here talking to you, but <laughs> we have been on this trajectory since 2021 when we had our last investor day and we outlined the plans to grow the company to other markets. We realized that the technology we produce for mobile could be very disruptive and we could build actually a leading position, what we did in automotive, what we did in PCs. And we thought it would be the right thing to tell investors as we look in the next five years, how are we going to diversify the company? When you look at the company right now, uh, most of our revenue is mobile. Mobile is a great market, but it doesn't grow as much until we have an AI upgrade cycle. Uh, however, those other markets that we're going, it will drive higher multiples. So as those revenues from non-mobile become a bigger percentage of Qualcomm, we have an opportunity to actually see a multiple expansion. So we want to outline to investors our trajectory. And what's exciting is really where we are right now. We're very happy with the results of the company in the, in the near term. We show on the last earnings call we're growing in all markets, including handsets. And we put out in five years, we're going to have $22 billion of non-handset revenue. But bearing any cyclicality on the market, we expect to continue to grow annually into, that, uh, into those targets. Bearing any cyclicality. Can you just talk through, like, what are the downside risks to automotive demands, to people actually upgrading to new and refreshed Android phones, which are going to remain... Pro yeah, what, what I mentioned about cyclicality, I think the semiconductor industry, we have seen on the past, the past few years, we had a bunch of different cycles, different markets, uh, inventory corrections, we have... Uh, capacity constraints. We're not assuming that going forward, but some of that, you know, could happen. But when you look of the normalization of the market we see right now, if that continues, uh, we feel very good about the ability to grow annually. When, to your question is, cars is one that we're incredibly excited because um, people are now buying new cars because of the computational capabilities and the, those big screens and the digital capabilities of the car. And I think that's what actually creating demand for our technology. Going in, before we get to cars, the Internet of Things is really going to be something that we've been talking about almost for a decade, the Mobile World Congress. And remember, everyone's exuberant about Internet of Things. And then reality never quite gets there. And that's where previous times you've made targets and perhaps have had to fall short because the ecosystem doesn't build. What makes you sure it will get to that $14 billion this time? Like, we're very confident, but, but I, would like to, I would like to break that down for you. Yeah. Um, so, first, PCs. Uh, because actually what I need to tell you is we talk about Internet of Things, but the Qualcomm Internet of Things revenue stream, there's a bunch of things in there. We have PCs, we have virtual reality, mixed reality 
uh, devices. We have industrial, we have networking and personal uh, devices like wearables and watches. That's our Internet of Things bucket. So if we gave a target of $4 billion in P6. If you think what we're doing right now, Snapdragon X series is the fastest processor. It's faster than Intel, faster than AMD. We come in, with, in the industry as a new player with a leading platform. The only platform that could run Microsoft Copilot Plus. If you look at this, of the service market, the TAM, or the SEM that were provided in Investor Day of PCs in 2029 is 35 billion. We say we're going to do four. It's a comp it's very achievable target, especially when you think about we have the best platform in the market today. But everyone does indeed love that silicon. Our own Bloomberg Intelligence saying you're in so silicon in the AI PC is great, but there's been so much cynicism around the adoption of of ARM-based PCs. What is stopping that? We actually see, we see a little bit different. We launched this platform in, in uh, May. We have 20 designs. Uh, right now, from May to today, we increased the design traction by 2.5 times. We have 58 now platforms across Dell, HP, Lenovo, Samsung, Acer, Asus. And people are buying them? And the, the sales are exceeding our expectations. So that's why we feel confident. And if you think about the target, we put in $4 billion in a $35 billion SAM, it's not that high. The other one is industrial. Right. And you asked me about IoT. One thing, uh, Caroline, did change the IO, IoT and industrial is AI at the edge. The ability to run AI at the edge. We can run multi-billion parameter model into a device at the edge, that changes the cost equation for a lot of companies that actually think that it's gonna be cheaper than doing it in the cloud, or they have specific needs. That inflection point is what gives us confidence we're gonna get four billion in industrial by 2029, and the other two billion we provided uh, was for uh, augmented reality, and the Ray-Ban Meta Smart Glass, everybody talks about it, is probably the favorite Christmas gift uh, this season. Let's talk, therefore, about an inflection point when you go back to what had been your bread and butter, which is smartphones and cells. Are people upgrading? Are they going to upgrade, particularly on the Android devices that you sit with, because Apple is, of course, going to be pulling back for the next few years? Look, Android is is the largest global market for handsets, and we have been very focused on premium tier Android. What we see in the market that, that, that grows very, you know, phones grow with GDP, right? It's, a, it's flat to single digit growth because everybody has a phone. However, what we have seen is that the premium tier, they're growing uh, significantly. We see a mix change. When people buy their next phone, they want a better phone. And that, that actually allow us to be growing uh, in many cases like double digit on a market doesn't grow by expanding content. So what we expect is that is the trend as we people buy a premium smartphone with more AI and eventually as the AI use cases start to be as big as apps, we're gonna see an, an AI driven upgrade. We are sitting with the Qualcomm CEO, Cristiano Amon for our worldwide radio and TV audiences. The upgrade cycle grows with GDP, you were saying. China's GDP not looking so great. You have exposure to that economy. What does it feel like right now? Look, um, our, our China business is a business that we're very happy with it. As, uh, as geopolitics evolve, uh, actually our business with China expanded, especially because as we become relevant in automotive and industrial beyond phones, uh, we have Chinese customers. I think at the end of the day, regardless of uh, GDP growth, China is a big market. If you are a semiconductor company that you have a leading technology that cannot be replicated by a domestic product, you're going to have a big business in China, and that's what we but have. But they're fighting to make things domestically because of the new administration, and indeed the current administration, still pushing back on China. That you don't have any pause, any concern about tariffs ramp up, for example. Look, you should think about our business. We are exporting semiconductors. We're in the right direction of trade. Uh, for the United States, uh, especially when you think about trade balance. So, uh, so and, and if we have a leading technology, we expect that China will be interested in continuing to buy our chips. So we're not concerned about that. You don't have any procurement issues? You don't import anything? You're not having to stockpile? No, we, I think we have been, uh, re we're a fabulous company. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have been uh, a big exporter of chips into China.
you've got an amazing bird's eye perspective of the technological race that we like to talk of between US and China. For example, you've got an array of large language models within your Snapdragon mobile system and platform. Some of those are Chinese large language models. How do they perform compared to the US ones? Look, um, we can talk about this all day, but I'm gonna try to uh, summarize a few things. Uh, there's, uh, there's a very large number of models becoming available and they're very specialized. I think we're heading towards AI as being a new computing and you have models that specialize in voice, major specialized in, in imaging, like uh, large visual models, etc. What we're starting to see is a lot of those models are becoming regionalized, especially when you think about text and converse or conversation. Um, as the computer starts to speak the language of humans, every region has a unique aspect mm. that is driving a lot of regional models. We expect the future is going to be like that. China's going to have their models. Uh, you know, Europe's going to have their models. We're going to have our models. And they're going to be models specialized for different things. And we're just the beginning of this exciting new transition. You could talk about it all day. The thing that the markets, that the media have wanted you to talk about all day is whether you'll be making any acquisitions and whether you will potentially be making any acquisitions of Intel parts of the businesses. Your CFO outlined that, look, you're actually going to be giving money back to investors. Is M&A therefore not on the agenda? Uh, look, we have always been uh, looking uh, for opportunities. A lot of the Qualca M&A uh, framework with the outline has been opportunistic and or been very targeted to accelerate our plans. Uh, we, we have showed that with the M&A that we've done for Auto, the M&A that we've done uh, to enter the PC space. So you're probably going to continue to see Qualcomm doing that. Right now, at this point, we have not identified any large acquisition that uh, is necessary for us to execute on this $22 billion. And we're super focused on executing on the $22 billion in the next five years. So give us the confidence, give the investor base that's currently seeing perhaps your share price off by 6% at the moment, give them the confidence that this transition away from Apple and focusing in on Android, but focusing in on the Internet of Things opportunity that you articulated, the autos, you're going to get there smoothly and with clarity on time frame. Yeah, look, the way, the way I see it, and I think that's probably, you know, I, I can't really, uh, uh, you know, talk about what's happened with this talk, but I think there may be some confusion. Our plan in the investor day is to tell investors that our strategy is working. We don't need a new strategy. It is working. We had executed on what we said we're going to do in those new markets like uh, Auto, for example. We have been have five consecutive quarters of record growth and we would grow even when the market doesn't grow because we're gaining share. Uh, we had deliver on our entrance on the PC and a well positioned to ramp and we told investors how this is going to play out with the other markets. We had said since the beginning that our planning assumptions assume that Apple is coming off the model. We had said our contract implies that we have 20% share in 26. Will that be the case? I don't know. I think we have had uh, two renewals of Apple but we have to make a planning assumption that Apple is coming off the model. Even with that, we are well positioned to continue growing through the period and get to a point in 2029 that we have 22 billion of revenue non-mobile. And when we get to the end of the decade, we have a potential of 50-50. Mobile is about 50%, 50% of the revenue from growth market. So I don't know what the anxiety is, but I think we feel confident about the plan and we'll continue to execute on that plan. So HANA analyst Christopher Rowland saying we continue to have confidence in CEO Aman's ability to move Qualcomm beyond modem and cellular IP company. We appreciate you. Thank you for being here, Qualcomm CEO Cristiano Aman. Now, let's have a quick check out of this particular chart of a chip company that you're not looking at every day. Semiconductor Manufacturing International shares, SMIC as it's known, they've more than doubled over the past two months, even amid the risks tied to competition to geopolitical tensions in China. The stock is up 120% from September, trouncing global sector names, including NVIDIA, TSMC. As you see, China outperforming, particularly on land in Beijing trading. Meanwhile, speaking of NVIDIA, look, all eyes on the company reporting earnings after the closing bell. We'll discuss what to expect, particularly with Blackwell. This is Bloomberg Technology.
there's always the potential for hiccups in any one quarter. Obviously, we all heard about that that design issue for servers with Blackwell, but we also heard from Michael Dell saying we're working around it or it's not gonna be a problem because there's just so much demand. So there's always room for hiccups, but we do see the long-term prospects of NVIDIA to be really robust. NVIDIA's quarterly results and the forecast. They're out after the closing bell today. Analysts will be on the lookout to see whether the world's most valuable company can sustain what has been a remarkable run. Fueled by spending, of course, on AI hardware, Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Kunjan Sabani joins us now. Everyone wants clarity on the supply side of Blackwell and demand for the hopper too. Yeah, I mean, look, second half, we have seen the demand for the hopper expand, not just at the top large cloud service providers and hyperscalers, but beyond them to the SOEN, which now we expect them to be double, low double digits this fiscal year with the enterprise, with the tier two uh, cloud service providers. So we don't see any limiting in, in terms of demand for hopper and everyone's anticipatingly waiting for the Blackwell ramp, which we think we'll see major portion of it next year. We all seem to focus on revenue. It, it's going to double for the full year, we anticipate. It's going to be up 80% for third quarter, up a little bit less than that for the fourth quarter is the expectation. But what about margins? What about profitability, Kunjan? Yeah, I mean, look, we have seen the peak of the margins. They're behind us. Uh, going into 4Q, we expect it to not as low, low as some people uh, are concerned. We expect it to still stay above the 73% mark. But going into 2025 with Blackwell as a new product ramping, uh, we don't. We expect it to stay at the same levels. We have also seen the cost of the new products increase, but their ability to charge equivalently more pricing is not going there because there's a lot of pricing pressure. These are very expensive GPUs. They sure are. And it's a very expensive stock. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst, Kunjan Sabani, we thank you. Let's turn about that valuation now with Kim Forrest, founder and CIO of Booker Capital Partners. Kim, we've had almost 200% run up in NVIDIA over the last year. And indeed, that's on top of a tripling the previous year. We have a right. massive valuation. Is it too high? Well, um, if you get into it today, maybe. I don't know. We'll, we'll tell you at the end of the day. Hmm. The problem that I see, and let me just say this. I'm a believer in AI in general. I'm a little bit skeptical of generative AI. I think it has a lot of um, issues that just can't be solved through the brute force, throw more chips at it. But that being said, I, I'm rooting for AI. Now, the problem with evaluation on NVIDIA is you laid it out. It's already had a triple, a double, a, you know, everything. It's as if it's a quarter being tossed and coming up heads, heads, heads. There is a day it's going to come up tails, and momentum investors are going to freak out. And with every earnings call now that we have, that day gets closer. Is it today? I don't think so, but I don't know. And that's really my problem with this, that it's a stock driven by momentum. To be fair, they have freaked out before after earnings, even when they meet and beat, but the forecast isn't living up to expectations. So what is it that you therefore need to hear from Jensen to give you the confidence? It feels like you're pushing against the scaling laws that actually he continues to think thrive at the moment. Exactly. Well, there's, there's a couple of things that concern me. Um, there is a handful of companies that are willing to spend unbelievable amounts of money on this. Now, if one of them blinks, will the other ones kind of cool down and, you know, stop shoveling money to the, into this problem? That's the one thing. So who are we talking about? Apple, Meta, um, and Microsoft are the big ones, right? Maybe Amazon as well. But those are certainly the companies that have the cash flow that they don't even have to question it. They're going to spend, spend, spend. But, you know, that's a very narrow market if you're going to think of it that way. So, you know, I'm just a cautious investor and everything has gone right. So that demand is key. And Blackwell mm. is a little bit of a concern. Yes, it's not really shipping yet. They'll probably modify the problem that's causing overheating. You know, when these things get out into the world, they're used differently than they've been tested for. We've seen this many times in yeah. other semiconductor cycles.
but it's all a concern for, you know, the thing that leads the market now. It, you know, it drives all the markets. It's a, such a high component of the S&P 500. Kim, it's a macro event. Do you buy on yes. weakness? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question? Do you buy on weakness? Do I buy on weakness? I'm going to look at it very hard on weakness because, again, I still think, given what the other makers of chips and even the people who are dreaming of being competitors of NVIDIA, NVIDIA has a nice long runway to have people not catch up to them. So mm. there's some safety in there, but valuation is steep at this point. Proceed with caution. Boca Capital Partners, CIO, Kim Forrest. We appreciate your time. Meanwhile, coming up, Global Foundries Chips Grant gets finalized. More on the big incentives coming to those chip makers making in America. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for Talking Tech, and first up, Global Foundries has been awarded $1.5 billion by the Biden administration's CHIPS Act. The grant will support the chipmaker's expansion of two factories and one new plant in the United States that is estimated to create 1,000 production jobs and employ 9,000 construction workers. Plus, Salesforce plans to cut workers from its recently acquired data management startup, OWN. The company says some roles will not be required, quote, post-harmonization and set an end date of January 31st for those employees, while others will remain on a short-term basis if needed for the transition. And shares of MicroStrategy rising today, catapulting the market value to more than $100 billion. This is the company announced plans to increase the amount of convertible senior debt it plans to sell in an effort to buy more Bitcoin. Now owns about $40 billion worth. Coming up, we're joined by Strike founder and CEO Jack Mallers, as traders are making bullish bets on Bitcoin alongside Michael Saylor, clearly, over at MicroStrategy. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in your New York. Let's get you a quick check on these markets because, well, in my anticipation to tell you where I'm from, it's because we've got Nasdaq 100 off by more than a percentage point at the moment. Look, we're drag lower in terms of a points perspective by the likes of Tesla off by, well, currently dragging us down by 26 points. But so too is NVIDIA. We're off by one and a half percent when you're looking at the overall market cap erosion of the business. This is as we anticipate the all important macro event that is their earnings. Fiscal third quarter, will we see that increase in revenue as the market are anticipating. Are we going to see a point forward that we could see up to $37 billion in terms of revenue for their fiscal fourth quarter? There ultimately could be an 8% move, according to options trading, on this stock, which would be $300 billion in market cap in one day alone. Look, what else is moving? Crypto. But actually, there has still been that risk on sentiment in Bitcoin that drives us up another 1.5%. We're at 93,661. And this, as it's more about the feel-good factor around future policy in the United States and indeed some heavy buyers continuing for their balance sheet. Let's talk about it and the industry at large. Because, of course, it spent a lot in terms of lobbying on candidates across party lines during the 2024 election. And those efforts clearly seem to have paid off. Stand with Crypto, a group that tracks those results, says 275 pro-crypto candidates were elected to the U.S. House, 20 in the Senate. Now they're looking at how those lawmakers will influence the industry, including the policy of President-elect Trump. Here to detail what the political effects are, what just buying is like at the moment, Strike CEO Jack Manners, who actually has a pretty close relationship with one of the senators who has been long with the red eyes. Yes. Cynthia Loomis. And I'm interested in ultimately what you've seen in terms of trading on the platform since the election. 
Uh, the day post-election, the Wednesday post-election, our business doubled. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw 100% growth in Bitcoin purchases. Our customers are predominantly purchasing Bitcoin and over 90% since election are actually taking the Bitcoin off the platform and holding it in their own custody. So we're not seeing active speculative trading on gambling on the short-term price. We're seeing long-term accumulation on our platform and our customers are excited. We serve Bitcoiners and Bitcoiners are excited right now. Okay, so you're maybe supporting those that are focused purely on the ecosystem, but people are going elsewhere to trade, whether it's gambling or not. We now got options trading on the yeah. Bitcoin spot ETFs. What do you think of that? What do you make of this transition from, well, DeFi and, and crypto into more traditional finance? Well, the last time I was on this show, I told you and Ed, which Ed, congrats, by the way, I'm thinking of you. Um, I told you guys, I thought Bitcoin was the only money in crypto. Hmm. I wasn't sold on any of the other cryptocurrencies and that my business, we're predicated on Bitcoin as money and we sell our customers financial services. So if you're a customer of mine, you want Bitcoin financial services, you want to buy it, you want to store it, you want to move it, you want to pay your bills with it, you maybe want a loan against it. These are the type of products that we want to serve our customers in the future. We do not think of ourselves as a speculative exchange. So that's my customer base. Options, ETFs, MSTR, all of these things are pro-liquidity for Bitcoin. What you want in a money or a store of value is you want it to be saleable. You want it to be liquid at any point, 24-7, 365, globally. You want to be able to sell it. Mm. And so all of this is pro-liquidity, which enhances the profile for Bitcoin to be a better asset for a government, a corporation, an individual. So everything is bullish for Bitcoin. That's what I always say. So another day, um, more bullish activity for the asset. Okay, convince me of why <laughs> for this liquidity, for this vision, for the future of money, you need a strategic Bitcoin reserve, because I know that's what you've been speaking to Cynthia Ooh. Loomis about. Sorry, we're having infrastructure issues Not today. your fault, <laughs> not your fault. Um, here, you know, I think the unique positioning on the Bitcoin Strategic Reserve, I think if this happens, this will be one of the most important economic announcements in U.S. history. I think it'd be on par with 1971 and Nixon. However, hmm. what I think is not being talked about enough is it's positive, Caroline. It's because, positive. Well, because you'd have to go out there and buy in the market, but will that actually happen? No, my, my meaning is this. In 1933, the U.S. had a really big economic announcement. What was it? We're taking all your gold. Hmm. In 1971, the U.S. had a really big economic announcement. What was it? We're divorcing ourselves from the gold standard so we can print money. In 2008, the U.S. had a really big economic announcement. What was it? It was we're bailing out all the big banks that misbehaved. In 2025, if the U.S. has a really big economic announcement, what is it? It's we're pro-technology, we're pro-innovation. What principles and morals and ethical alignment does Bitcoin have? Equal rights, equal opportunity, an open network. These are American ideals, American values. This is an asset that was accessible to the people 15 years ago that the people own. Governments only own two, three, four percent of this asset. This asset is held by the people. It acts in the best interest of the public. It's pro jobs. It's pro energy. It's pro industry. It's pro growth. And does anyone else have a plan to get us out of debt? Are we going to start a lemonade stand out here in Times Square? No. How about the best performing asset in the history of mankind? We lean into it. We buy it. Coinbase is an American company. Strike's an American company. Kraken's an American company. Tether sells the U.S. dollar. Let's support these businesses. Let's support this industry. But the market cap is less than NVIDIA for the entire crypto ecosystem. When does that become bigger? I think when people buy it. Listen, I, I, don't, I think that ego gets in the way of many people. People think they're late to Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I don't understand that, right? I think that late according to who? Oh, because you're comparing yourself to Michael Saylor. You're comparing yourself to your college roommate. You're comparing yourself to your coworker. Over the last 15 years, right. the best thing you could have done is buy Bitcoin. And I think that's going to be true for the next 1,500 years. And so as a country, I think we have a choice. I think everyone else around the world is understanding we are pro-growth, pro-business, pro-Bitcoin as this new administration takes office. And we have to make a decision. I think the worst thing we can do is not own enough. And actually, to de-risk this, we should buy some and push these American ideals in technology and innovation and growth through the best performing asset and technology in mankind. Let's see if she can get that through Congress. Strike CEO Jack Mallers. Great to have you in the house. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Coming up, SpaceX. It achieves new feats during its sixth major test launch of the Starship system. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. Let's just take 
a look at a new trend in Silicon Valley, tender offers. Up until recently, there was a bit of a stigma if a venture firm sold a lot of shares in a portfolio company before an IPO. It was seen kind of as a sign that the firm didn't believe in the startup's continued growth, but now that stigma is just going away. Let's discuss Bloomberg's Katie Roof's piece he wrote all about this in today's Tech Daily. And it does feel every other day we're getting another announcement of a tender offer. You did Databricks, you've had SpaceX, but it's not a negative. That's right. And so, you know, secondaries have always been a thing, but what's different is the stigma has gone. You know, as companies take 10, 15 years to IPO, it's no longer seen as you're giving up. It's just a sign that you need liquidity for your LPs, where you often, you know, if you're a venture firm, you often have to return um, cash back within 10 years. Talk to us about how it gets done. How formalized is the secondary market becoming? Well, sure. There's different types of transactions. There's the tender offers, which are usually, you know, they're sanctioned by the company. They're large transactions where often the employees will also sell shares. But there's also a lot of one-off trades and there's a lot of brokers out there, a lot of different intermediaries helping, you know, to transact between buyers and sellers on these private trades. Does this end up putting off yet further IPOs? In some cases, it does, because part of the pressure for IPOs is often because employees or insiders want to get liquidity. They want to be able to buy that house, those employees that have been there forever. And so that pressure goes away when those employees and those, those insiders are able to get liquidity. And so, yes, it does absolutely contribute to a delay in IPOs. Bloomberg's Katie Roof. We thank you. And we were just discussing with Katie the SpaceX tender that we've been hearing about. Well, of course, it's actually just marked another successful launch with its Starship rocket in its sixth major test. That's as Elon Musk and President-elect Trump watched from afar. Here's what one SpaceX investor had to say about the company's triumphs. You don't want to be in SpaceX's way, right? If you're building, um, there's a lot of benefits to SpaceX is building the railway. And there, there's a lot of benefit that now new uh, opportunities become available that weren't available before. But you don't really want to be building something that's on their roadmap. They are the apex player. Let's get more from expertise in the space field. Laurie Garver, operating advisor at Bessemer Venture Partners, former NASA deputy administrator. Joining us now, you've got a book out. You've worked alongside the likes of Elon Musk. He thinks very highly of you. And I'm interested in about what you made of these new feats, in particular, what this sixth test launch really showed us, because they didn't get to catch once again with those so-called chopsticks. Yeah, this... This test was a mix. However, I would definitely put it in the win column. We aren't used to seeing uh, an, a company or even a government agency push technology like SpaceX is doing. And on this flight, although it was disappointing not to get the catch, we knew that was a possibility. They're making good calls. They're making safe calls. The Starship itself, which is actually the more complex and important vehicle, went on to succeed beyond anyone's uh, imagination. Mm. They are taking out weight of the vehicle by eliminating tiles just to test the boundaries, uh, to make sure that they are getting the most out of every second of the vehicle. And seeing that stage land, the second stage, into the ocean in such a controlled way, that's the goal. The goal is continuing to march on to a fully reusable two-stage vehicle and they made a lot of progress uh, also with the engine lighting on uh, the second vehicle on the second stage. So mm. uh, a mix, but I'd put it in the wind column. Okay, so the fact that it survived re-entry through Earth's atmosphere, the fact that we saw a reigniting of one of the Raptor engines steering that suddenly becomes possible, just pitch us forward. What next is achievable? What, ultimately, how quickly can we suddenly see trips to Mars on this kind of a vehicle? Well, I, th I think the key is that the speed over the next couple of years, if we are seeing the cadence increase as we did with their Falcon 9 vehicle, where they're launching more than 100 a year, Gwen Shotwell recently said they'll be uh, at the 400 mark in four years with this vehicle. I mean, if they can make that, you then will be having on-orbit fuel transfers. That's the key to going beyond low Earth orbit. Whether this administration is still gonna wanna fulfill a lunar ambition, 
We don't know, but definitely we're hearing the president-elect and Elon talk about Mars trips, and mm. those require refueling in low Earth orbit, a technology that isn't proven, but isn't that complex. Uh, you could see missions to Mars, as they're talking about, in yeah. the four or five year time frame. I doubt they would put people on them, but that is indeed what the president has at least uh, talked about doing within his term. I mean, Laurie, yeah, we were just seeing pictures of President-elect Trump there alongside Elon Musk. You've been there. You were in that transition team, the NASA transition team with President-elect Obama at the time. How likely are we to see other companies thrive in this new era where SpaceX is so integral and so close to the next administration? Well, it, it is a, a really strange trajectory in the sense that the Obama transition team that I led back in 2008 and 2009 set us on a course for a more competitive uh, arrangement to have our space transportation to and from low Earth orbit that gave the opening to SpaceX that they have absolutely run through and now have dominated the market. You couldn't have guessed back then how much farther ahead they would be than everyone else. Mm -hmm. They hadn't even been able to get contracts through uh, the military side, and now they're the dominant player. So at this point, I think any transition team, uh, once they're there, if the Trump folks even go this route, is to put in policies that will allow for more competition. The goal is never a monopoly. In fact, we did what we did because there was a monopoly, the United Launch Alliance, and it was much more expensive to the government. So as much as politically uh, things are really tense uh, between competitors right now, there's there's no reason we shouldn't be able to inspire more people than just SpaceX to be making these advancements. And yeah. I don't think we want just a single player. So briefly, Laurie, where do you back in the tech stack of, of ultimately rocket companies and space industry right now? Well, at, at this point, United Launch Alliance is still launching. It's more expensive. They're not reusable. Blue Origin has launched now their Vulcan rocket. And I think in 2025, we'll launch New Glenn, which is supposed to be reusable over the longer term. Uh, the Europeans are developing new vehicles, mostly not reusable. Uh, so there is no question SpaceX is in the lead. As I've said in my book, uh, be hard for anyone to catch up in 10 years uh, unless uh, SpaceX and Elon trips. Hmm. Escaping gravity, your first hand account of the new era of NASA and space. Laurie Garver, also of Bessemer Venture Partners, we thank you very much. Coming up, Comcast plans a cable TV spin off. We'll have all the details. This is Blue Mag Technology. There could be more decline. It could level off. YouTube TV, Hulu Live. Uh, Is it going to hurt your soul a little bit if YouTube TV surpasses you as the biggest cable operator? Not if they're using Xfinity broadband and watching NBC and watching whatever. <laughs> we will have transitioned our company pretty carefully. We're going to, you know, be pretty happy with the Comcast NBC Universal we got. Transitioning carefully, the Comcast CEO Brian Roberts there back in October at Bloomberg Screen Time when he floated the idea of perhaps spinning off the company's cable networks into a new company in the face of an industry-wide decline in subscribers. Now Comcast confirmed it. Spin-off of cable TV channels including MSNBC, CNBC, USA. Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw is here with why that um, level of detail on those channels and what they actually leave out in terms of certain channels. Well, they, they will keep NBC, which is the broadcast network. It's got most of, or the kind of their biggest sports rights, including pro football and what will be a lot of pro basketball starting next year. Uh, it has their sort of hard news gathering business, and it also is uh, an entertainment business. They're kind of their biggest entertainment business. They're also keeping Bravo, 
that's because Bravo programming does quite well on Peacock. You know, when they're mm -hmm. thinking about the future of their entertainment business, there's three pillars. There's their studio business in LA, which produces film and television. There's their theme parks. And then there's kind of what has been cable networks, but now is really all about streaming. And so all the cable networks that don't fit into that streaming future that have been a drag on their stock because they're not a, a fast growth business are getting spun out into something completely separate. And what does that Spinco, as it's currently still called, end up becoming, Lucas? It's $7 billion in annual revenue. Does that grow? Does that shrink? It's going to be up to the new leadership, which is Mark Lazarus, who's a top person at NBC Universal now, will be the CEO of that new company. He was one of the architects of Comcast's deal for the NBA rights. You know, the Comcast executives that I've spoken with believe that this new Spinco could be a vehicle for acquisition. It could go and buy other cable networks. It could go and buy some other media assets. Um, it could also be something that a private equity firm wants to come and buy. It's, it's a little bit unclear. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the industry look at it and see it as something that will sort of over time shrivel and die. But there is a belief that it could be a vehicle for acquisitions that Comcast wouldn't want to do. Luca Shaw, appreciate the analysis. Thank you. Let's talk more about reorientating, pivoting. Hasbro wants to shift its focus back to play. The maker of G.I. Joe action figures, Mr. Potato Head, is moving away from perhaps the film and the TV business side, instead focusing on digital versions of some of the most popular brands. Bloomberg's Cecilia D'Anastasio joins us now with gaming. Like, where does the vision of some of their iconic IP end up going? It's a good question. Video games for Hasbro, they feel very intuitive because it's grounded in play. You're thinking, you know, kids growing up with Play-Doh, G.I. Joe. Now they want to play video games. They want to play video game versions of you know, G.I. Joe on consoles and on PCs. What's so fun, the way in which you've written the story, is you deep dive on Chris Cox, is the CEO, relatively new, taking over after the passing of the previous leader. And he's a gamer at heart. Like, you talk about how into the card game he was playing. Chris Cox and I played Magic the Gathering together during our uh, meeting in New York City. He beat me, I'm sad to say. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> but we also got to talk a lot about the future of Magic the Gathering, which is a... Um, playable, tradable, collectible card game. It's several decades old, really popular, and um, a huge driver of sales for the Wizards of the Coast division of Hasbro. Let's just talk about, ultimately, their buyers, because I've got a son who's obsessed with Pokemon, and there's a whole load of cards and paraphernalia we keep on buying. Who are the demographic? Because there's also older collectors. There's also people who've loved it and grown up with it, and therefore, do they transition to the gaming, too? Or is it really about the younger demographic? Magic the Gathering is a game that's really complicated and difficult to get very good at, but younger people can enjoy it too. Right now, what Hasbro is contending with is the fact that there are a lot of older Magic the Gathering players who want to continue playing with their friends and their family and their communities, but they're also launching all of these cards, for example, with Marvel and Lord of the Rings themes to bring in newer, younger players. How do they partner? Do they build internally? Do they go externally? What does the future look like? Magic the Gathering is incorporating um, IP from other companies into the cards, so that will just basically look like, you know, Spider-Man or Wolverine mm -hmm. uh, images on these playing cards. Okay. Partnerships, cross IP, cross businesses, cross platforms as well. We love it. Thank you. It's a great read. Go check it out. Bloomberg Cecilia D'Anastasio with the latest when it comes to all things Hasbro. Now, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Look, you do not want to forget about not only our podcast, but also what's happening later after the bell. NVIDIA coming out with its earnings. All important macro event for the entire market. You're going to be seeing up to, what, $300 billion of market capitalization move any which way. This is a $3 trillion company. Currently, we're off by four tenths percent on the NASDAQ 100, tugged lower by the likes of NVIDIA. We are off of our lows, though. 145.93 is where we trade. Can we see a future of Blackwell's supply side matching up with the demand? We'll have a special coming to you on Bloomberg TV at 4 p.m. in Eastern time. But for now, check out what we just cut for you on the show, on the terminal, online on Apple and Spotify and iHeart by tuning in to our podcast. This is Bloomberg Technology.